Could you please speak to the potential medical applications? Um, yeah, so uh, again, one of our design spe uh, specifications was uh, that we want to use this in medicine. And uh, like Angela was talking about, having them be vial type was really important for us. Um, so we are not sort of inserting any foreign DNA that could, when in turn deployed in the human body, could have off-target effects. So for that reason, it was important for us to keep the human DNA vial type. So we've tried from more than 20 different human donors. And in every single time, we were able to create an anthrobot. And um, that's across a lot of different ages um, and, you know, genders and races. And we've seen that this works with a lot, you know, diverse like human genomes. Um, so what sort of more specifically in the medical field that we are hoping to accomplish is can we take a, a cell from a human donor so currently, as we mentioned, we're taking these from the human airway epithelium, but down the line, you can envision taking a cell from a human uh, patient's skin and then uh, turning it into a induced pluripotent stem cell, which in turn would basically revert the clock and have the ability to then be differentiated into all these different kinds of tissues in the human body, including the human lung. So in terms of application, that's what we're envisioning. That's not something we've shown in the paper, but that protocol has already been worked out in the literature. Um, so starting with a human skin cell and then turning it into an, into an anthrobot that is... Uh, geared towards a specific application based on what that patient might need. Uh, and then when we put that into the body, it's, it is a synthetic construct. It's something that doesn't, um, you know, it, there's no such thing as an anthrobot in the human body. It is a synthetic construct. It has a new architecture, but it has the exact same genome as, as that patient. So the body won't recognize it as a, or that's our current hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Um, as a, as a foreign object and will right. like trigger immune system and inflammation. Yeah, I was going to ask about if you all have tested biocompatibility or immunogenicity, if you're already envisioning it for medical applications. Uh, not yet. Our preliminary experiments have been with human cells, but in vitro only. So uh, next up for us would be ex vivo tissues, so human cells uh, extracted from humans, and then after that it would be um, in vivo or proxies for in vivo um, experiments. Mm -hmm. So that would be step three. <laughs> yeah, but the but the, you know the I mean these cells are already coming from the they they've already been inside the patient. So so while while we haven't specifically tested the, the immunogenicity in vivo, it, the chances are very high that it's going to work. I mean, these are these are the idea is personalized medicine. It's a bespoke mm -hmm. uh, kind of um, construct that's made of each patient's own cells. So it's likely fine. And I, I just I, I want to um, I just want to underscore the amazing the the thing that just just blows my mind every time I think about it. You know that last figure in that in that paper is basically showing just one initial thing that we found. That uh, that these guys can do, which is to to help um, neurons heal across a scratch wound in in two dimensional culture. Just just to think about that, your, the tracheal cells that are sitting in your body and they sort of sit there quietly for decades doing their thing and and, and using their cilia to waft uh, little particles and mucus and stuff up you know out of your lungs. The fact that if if uh, uh, liberated from their environment and given a chance to kind of re reboot their 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 multicellularity. They now have the ability to go around and uh, repair defects in other types of cells. Like we would have never known that. It's just amazing to me that 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 they have that capacity, and it, and it makes me wonder what what else you know what other cells are sitting around the your your body with capacities to to heal other components and to have other beneficial you know, pro-regenerative uh, types of uh, uh, outcomes on different parts of the body like that, that idea of releasing the um, the native healing potential of your own cells and letting them do new things that might be beneficial for the body, I think, I, I think is incredibly powerful. And I think we're just seeing the first glimpses of that here. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how this fits into the larger framework of your work? Because as I heard Gazem say, take a skin cell and turn it into a pluripotent cell. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of our previous conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, th there's a few, uh, the, 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 
kind of applications of these are, are in several different directions. On the one hand, we certainly want to use this for very specific practical purposes. So we think that um, once we gain uh, a better understanding of their uh, kind of native functions and, and a little bit uh, better on the programming end, we will be able to address all sorts of very specific conditions and we can sort of run down some of the early um, ideas that, uh, that, that we have. But there's a bigger picture here, which is uh, using the, using this uh, this biorobotics platform as a uh, kind of a simplified um, model system in which to crack the morphogenetic code. Uh, think about all of the problems of biomedicine, including birth defects, uh, traumatic injury, or or thus uh, failing to heal from traumatic injury, cancer, degenerative disease. All of these things have one thing in common, which is that they would go away if we had the ability to tell groups of cells what to build, right? That's that's the major uh, rate limiting step for regenerative medicine is that we do not understand how cellular collectives make decisions. Mm -hmm. We're pretty good on the hardware side for individual cells, right? So we, we know how cells differentiate. We know what the, um, what the various... Um, lots of various genes do and, and how they interact with each other and so on. But but this this idea of how do collections of cells make decisions that they're going to make a hand versus a foot versus something else. And more importantly, how we communicate our patterning goals to them. That is, if you want to build a new organ or you want to repair an existing organ or you want to make something that has never existed before, what information do you need to give to these cells and what interface can you use to get your 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 goals across to the uh, to the cellular collective, and that I think is is uh, critically important for unlocking the promise of regenerative medicine. And so that's that's what we're starting off here because you really have to uh, under be, before you can you can use all these fancy programming techniques, and that includes not just the traditional symbio that people are using, but also the stuff that we do in our lab, which is bioelectrical um, kinds of uh, communication with networks and so on. You really need to understand what are the baseline plasticities and competencies of these cells. What do they already know how to do and why? Why do they make decisions and uh, to uh, uh, take specific paths through anatomical space and build specific kinds of um, anatomies and so on? And so I think that's, it, you know, in the greater scheme of our lab's work, which is to understand how to communicate with the collective intelligence of cells. This is a very important uh, um, a model system in which we can now ask, okay, what kinds of stimuli, what kinds of information can we be giving to these cells to get them to build various things? Much like with the Xenobots, you know, these first papers uh, were all about characterizing their background kind of native competencies. We didn't engineer the heck out of them with new genes and all this stuff. We, we, we can, and we probably will in the future, but step one is to understand how, how do collections of cells make decisions about what they're going to do. Michael, can you also indicate, again, these are two different papers here that have an overarching theme, but outline how are they distinct and how are they the same? So one has to do with anthrobots or biobots, and then the other has to do with this embryonic yep. communication and the resilience. So please. Sure. Yeah, the, 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 the common, well, there, there are many common themes, but one, one important one is collective decision-making. So it's again, this idea of, uh, so, so in the case of the anthrobots, it's a question of understanding how groups of uh, normal cells with normal human um, genome-derived uh, molecular hardware are going to decide to work together to uh, make a specific new coherent construct with with new behaviors, new new functionalities, and so on. In the case of Angela, this is uh, and the um, and the cross embryo morphogenetic assistance. It's the idea that standard developmental biology studies how uh, cells cooperate to make a, a nice embryo. Well, it turns out that there's, this actually works on a higher level as well. So groups of embryos also work together to complete morphogenesis. And in both of these cases, what we want to understand is where is the information? What is the collective intelligence of these cells? What are they? What kind of problems are they able to solve? So in the case of the anthrobots, they're uh, they're uh, able to. Um, uh, uh, they, they find themselves in a new environment, uh, in a new uh, kind of a, a new scenario, and they're able to put together a very coherent uh, form that is able to to live for weeks and and and, and have certain functions and so on. In the case, in, in Angela's case, what you're seeing is again a kind of collective problem solving, but this time at the level of whole animals. So not down at the cellular level, which is standard developmental biology. It's kind of I, you know, maybe this is the beginnings of a kind of uh, sort of um, hyper developmental biology or uh -huh. something where what you're really trying to work out is the rules by which um, whole bodies communicate to better achieve, be better solve the problem of, of, of embryogenesis. Because one of the things that, well, many people have studied in our lab focuses on in particular is 
uh, in, in, in biological intelligence in the sense of problem solving. That means when you're confronted with a new scenario that you haven't seen before, especially a new scenario that you haven't seen before, uh, are you able to complete your goals? In the in case of development, are you able to uh, make the target morphology that, um, that that you want to make? You know, a correct embryo or some other functional thing. In the case of in the case of anthropods, and so that's what, what that's what we're seeing in both of these uh, in both of these projects. We're seeing new unexpected competencies at different levels at the level of cells and then at the level of organisms uh to do something um, helpful and coherent in novel circumstances if you enjoyed that clip then the full podcast is out right now you can click around here enjoy subscribe to theories of everything to get notified of upcoming podcasts as there are new full-length podcasts every week on the topics of mathematics physics consciousness free will and ai